opened the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 22. The ethics, morality, practicality, patriotism of hacking. Um, I'm one of the feds, I guess this is my third time up here. Uh, the reason they asked me to come and talk to you is a, a couple, for a couple of reasons. One of the things I do professionally is uh, try to protect the infrastructure, the IT and weapons systems for the U.S. Army. I work for the Army Chief Information Officer, and my job is to do information assurance, policy program architecture, acquisition, and finally implementation to the program managers across the Army, uh, wherever we may deploy or wherever we may have a presence uh, to protect our systems. I started this business uh, about uh, 27 years ago, 27, 30 years ago, where my greatest enemy in protecting my systems was the evil empire. Uh, concerned about uh, the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, uh, those kind of folks who had a substantial uh, capability to take our system down or listen to them or exploit them. I'm a veteran of Vietnam and I'm also a veteran of the Gulf War and I'm very aware of what can happen when people listen into your system. In Vietnam, we used to be very concerned about something called imitate, imitative communication deception. And if you haven't seen the history films, I suggest you take a look at them because it hasn't changed all that much. Whether you're getting into a system today and looking at data, or you're listening to a FM, AM radio channel, such as we had in Vietnam, listening in to where the next helicopter drop zone was going to be, or the next landing zone was going to be, or the next pickup, it was all information gleaned. What they used to do to us in Vietnam was capture or listen to our radios, on secure radios I might add, listen to a 10 digit coordinate in which a helicopter would come in to pick up people or, or to drop people off. And the folks on the ground would radio back to the helicopter pilot or the team chief and say, hey man, land where I pop yellow smoke. Well guess what they would do, they would hear that and there'd be two areas on the ground with yellow smoke. And it was a 50-50 chance that the helicopter would land in the right place, and if he didn't uh, land in the right place, he was received with uh, direct and indirect fire. That is real, real cyber warfare starting back in the mid-60s. Uh, those kind of lessons, I tell you, have not, uh, have not lost themselves in the business that I do today. Um, I'm here today, if you read uh, what's on the agenda, to talk about uh, patriotism, morality, ethics of hacking, and so forth. But I must do a disclaimer right off the bat. The rest of my presentation and the speech I'm going to do today is my opinion. It is not the opinion of the U.S. government. It is not the opinion of the Secretary of the Army. It is certainly the opinion of the Army Chief Information Officer. It is strictly mine. I, uh, I want to first of all thank the uh, organizers of uh, DEF CON for inviting us uh, out here. This is a great opportunity for us. We've, uh, we've interfaced with a whole lot of you all out here, uh, picked up a great number of tips, uh, and I think after yesterday's Meet the Fed panel, we are a little more sensitized to some of your concerns as well. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today, and I hope that I made the right decision by leaving my Kevlar at home. <laughs> Actually, I was at DEF CON last year, as I mentioned, and I was pointed out as a Fed in record time. Uh, Carl Lewis had nothing on me on this one. I guess I must have been either the cowboy boots or the uh, just for Mangel, uh, so you can't tell. Uh, but I will tell you, I did get a haircut for you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> so anyway, since I couldn't hide anymore, and I do appreciate and understand the value of what this conference uh, does and can do, and what you bring to the industry and community and the impact you have on the, governor, on the government, I just simply said, okay, well, I'll be a speaker this year. Before uh, they let me come up here, though, they warned me uh, not to bore anyone to death, not to get on my military high horse, and at no time and under any circumstance was I to be allowed to make any reference to anti-online or a guy named JP. <laughs> However, I think Peter Shipley and I could talk about some things uh, after the conference as well on that. There are a few things I want to say today, and after, I'm, uh, after that I'm, I'll point out, if you haven't got your t-shirt yet, uh, a lot of my co-workers are in the audience here. And I'm rather proud of the feds that came out to this conference because they're harder to spot than they were last year. <laughs> 
there are certainly a multi-talented group of individuals gathered here today. A group that many profit-seeking computer security headhunters would give their firstborn to recruit. And I've talked to many of you. The best of the best in the elite, there's no question. Computer security companies have probably approached many of you, and I know that some of you are even now currently employed by some. The irony of that situation certainly hasn't missed any of us in the Department of Defense or the corporate world or the FBI or a number of other people who find it hard to accept that the very people who stir up the coals are the ones getting paid to put out the fires. Could not be compared to hiring a thief to install a security system in your home. Would you appreciate his ex expertise when he comes back three weeks later and relieves you of that stereo system that you just procured? Hackers working for computer security companies? What a combination. You know, they say that a large percentage of criminals return to prison after being caught continue a crime using many of the new, new techniques they learned while they were in jail. These people then lived in the environment consisting of all the expertise in their career field. Criminals meet criminals. Wouldn't a hacker working in a computer security company be almost the same? When, they hire, when they're hired to work for these firms, it isn't like being a kid in a candy store. All the latest and greatest tools, technology that they've heard about, but didn't have access to, or maybe didn't have money to buy right there at the fingertips. Can all hackers honestly say that they wouldn't be at least bit tempted to do a little vulnerability testing on their own once they were on the inside? This was discussed yesterday during the Meet the Fed panel. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that everyone would do it, but I am saying that there's a certain percentage would consider it. And that is a big percentage that most employers don't want to risk. Many of you may say I'm stereotyping, and not everyone with a hacking background does illegal hacking. And that if, if they did, it doesn't mean that they would continue to do it once they were hired to work for the good guys. But smokers, dieters, addicts of all kinds will tell you that it is a lot harder to change away your life than it is to give in to the habit one more time. Before I go, let me make something clear. I'm not labeling all hackers as criminals. I'm saying that criminals are criminals. If you haven't been caught for breaking the law, and if you have been caught for breaking the law, you're a criminal. If it is your passion and pastime to poke, prod, dissect computers, computer code without breaking any law, then you're a technician in high demand. When it comes to military, we have enough problems to worry about without adding convicted hackers or criminals to the payroll. And if you believe what you read in the papers or see on TV, I'm sure most of you would agree that we just don't, we just don't need any more trouble than we have. And it isn't, isn't it ironic, if you will, when we had the conversation yesterday about doing low vulnerability analysis just to show people how well they were insecure that someone took down the DEF COM homepage. And if you haven't seen that, you need to take a look at it. So you do yourselves, and that's kind of uh, telling. On the other hand, there's no question that we would benefit from hiring people at the level of intelligence expertise that these people have. Script kiddies excluded. <laughs> it's no secret that the biggest obstacle the military faces in its effort to run cybersecurity race is a lack of well-trained people who are always committed to the longevity that's required to complete this important task. Dr. Honker, Jeff Honker, was here on the platform uh, with you yesterday from the National Security Council, spoke about implementing initiatives that would keep that technical staff in place at least a little longer. More money is a great starting place, and that would also enable us to complete, compete for personnel in other corporate contract, uh, some of our friends, which we call Beltway Bandits be able to get those folks into the business. Why do hackers hack? Well, we consistently hear about the part of the hacker culture that claims that they do it for, a good of, for the good of computer security, and that pointing out vulnerabilities in other people's system is a good thing that educates the victim about the gross lack of their security. If they should happen to delete or alter a few files or alter a home page while they're at it, then so be it. I mean, I lock my door every night before I go to bed, but that doesn't mean that you're invited to come in and help yourself with my belongings. That's the same rationale that I use for people who use that argument. What about repercussions of these lessons? I can think of a few situations that are near and dear to my military heart. What would happen if a hacker broke in 
uh, through it and called it an education to make an educational point and point out vulnerabilities in the system that control the stocking and shipment of medical supplies to our troops abroad. Is it worth the lives of our countrymen to have bragging rights about owning someone else's box? How funny your education would it be if a shipment of weapons meant to protect our homes and families were replaced with packages of turmoil underwear to a few well-placed keystrokes. These things are all possible and they are of great concern to me. Is everything justified in the name of education? I think not. Then are those hackers who group themselves as hacktivists category. Hackers against child pornography, hackers against war, and so on. It is an honorable intent that they feel strongly about these issues and a lot of people share those concerns with them. Hackers want their voices to be heard, that's clear, but it is illegal to penetrate the best, in it. it's illegal to penetrate and it is, is that the best way to speak out? Have hackers stopped to think how much good is being done by their actions? Listen to what I'm thinking. How many children have been saved from the sick cold cruelties of child pornography by defacing the homepage? How many soldiers have been kept off the front lines by taking down the U.S. Army homepage? They also make the assumption that large numbers of people see these altered pages. But a, me but a message put up at 3 a.m. and taken down at 6 a.m. probably isn't going to be seen by influential political audiences, and they presume that it probably won't be seen by a lot of other people either. True, many sites archive these pages, which give them a lot more exposure. But if exposure to the evils of child pornography is the goal, then not, why not put up your own websites dedicated to saying child pornography is bad instead of risking legal action by tampering with someone else's. I'm certainly no expert, but I'm probably guess that writing a letter to a congressman or a senator or other local officials might get the ball rolling a little faster than a web page full of misspelled curse words. I can't help but think of how much work could be accomplished in the fight that could be won if hackers would mobilize their efforts in certain other directions. If they put up as much organized effort in riding a bike to work or not littering on the highways or car pooling, conserving energy or recycling as they do in illegal penetrating of other people's systems, we would certainly have a better planet to live on. If they put their considerable computer expertise to work in training, research, development facilities, we might even have shopping malls on the ocean floor or could be talking about putting condos on Mars. Right or wrong hasn't changed much since the beginning of time. And I wonder if hackers have stopped to consider the people who are being affected directly or indirectly by their evil deeds. You think about the system administrator who will spend for days repairing the damage that was done or a small business owner who may have to close down because he can't afford to restore the data that was destroyed. Take the Citibank incident, for example. Even though most of the money was recovered, a fairly large chunk was not. Why, or who do you think paid for that loss? Do you think Citibank just chalked it up to the old wealth factor? Or do you think that the taxpayers, consumers, including the culprits paid? As the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. What you do takes talent, patience, perseverance, determination, and a low-end computer with anything but a AOL account. What you do gets attention in the media, the military, your peers, and even the FBI on some occasions. What you do gives jobs to system administrators, network administrators, virus detection companies, software engineers, teachers, students, and lawyers. And all this is remarkable. Excuse me, folks. Uh, real quick announcement. Is there a Brett Bressler or Roman Israel in the audience? Or does anyone know these people? If you do, would you please ask them to go to the second floor and talk to a lady named Sharon. There is a family emergency that you need to handle immediately. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, all this is very, very remarkable. If it wasn't remarkable, many of the feds wouldn't be here today to hear what you have to say and hear what you have to uh, discuss and share with us. However, a famous patriarch of the dark side once said, Luke, I am your father. But he also lit up the night sky with his burning carcass. 
the point is that it may be fun to be a bad guy, but in the end, when it comes down to an eternity in hell or damnation, a few hours or days behind bars, or the FBI beating down your door in the middle of the night, wouldn't you rather choose the big hat and cliff chin of Dudley do right? Or besides, Dudley always gets the girl, and Olive Oil never chooses Brutus over Popeye. You're all talented, a group of talented people. Your career opportunities and learning potential will be far greater than any in my generation. The sky is limited, but there is a catch. The old saying is true about not being able to have your cake and eat it too. Illegal activity will never be rewarded, and those hackers that have escaped prosecution may feel like they'll never be caught. But sooner or later, justice will catch up, and they'll realize that no one is invincible. As for those hackers who feel productivity, illegal ways to use their talent, if you do it right, you have absolutely no boundaries. You can go anywhere you want. In closing, I have just this left to say. We, the G-Men, of the Department of Defense, in order to form a more secure network, establish firewalls, ensure domestic connectivity, provide for system administrators, promote the changing of passwords, and patch every exploitable hole known to man before Team Split Oak, Global Hell, or the Elves take them apart. Do you hereby request in the immortal words of Rodney King, why can't we just get along? Thank you very much. I have uh, seven minutes and I'll take any questions you have or we'll call it uh, even split here. Yes, sir. For an article a few months back in uh, Federal Computer Week, where you uh, gave a demo to a bunch of officers and put on a webcam or microphone, I was wondering what the general reaction was when that happened. Oh, I'm glad that's a good question. The, uh, the question was that he had read an article that uh, myself and Miss Robin, who is my personal hacker, uh, did a demo to some of the um, higher-ups in the government in which we broke into a system uh, exploiting uh, poor password management. Turned on a couple of directories, uh, captured some audio uh, through a WAV file, brought it back, uh, turned on some cameras, took their pictures and so forth. And, and the question was, what was your reaction to the leadership? Um, shock is probably the best word to sum that up. Um, I think that most of the leadership business understand that uh, people's email is in jeopardy, and they, um, they have grown to at least understand that risk. Uh, not sure that the higher up you go in the executive chain, that they fully understand the technical ramifications of that uh, capability. But when you turn on a, a capability to their local PC that captures them speaking, or if they happen to be silly enough to leave the camera plugged in and you can take their picture while they're speaking, uh, that kind of really uh, makes them quickly aware of the vulnerabilities of the technology and where to place it and so forth. I gave that demonstration to some folks at the Army War College. And I'll tell you a little funny story here. There was a lady in the front. Uh, you could tell by her body language she was extremely nervous and uh, under significant stress, which worried me because it is not my intent when I do these presentations to put anybody in a heart attack mode. So I finally stopped the demo. I asked Miss Robin to, uh, to quit for a minute. And I asked this lady straight up, I said, is there something I can do for you? I mean, would you like a glass of water or something of this nature? She said, no. She said, um, you know, I'm really pissed at my husband. And I'm trying to understand what my demonstration had to do with her uh, present feeling about her husband. And I said, well, why is that, ma'am? I mean, I started the conversation. She had my interest, a couple hundred people in the audience. I said, why is that? She says, you know, I told him to take the, the computer out of our bedroom. <laughs> I think we at least made one convert that day. <laughs> Any other questions? Sir? Um, would you like to comment on there's a new story floating around that um, in some US TV better agencies are appointing actors to hack into the bank account so you can spot on officials and they please don't remind them of those events. If you can confirm or deny that, if it's true, how does that relate to hacking into the account? Um, 
I really don't know anything about that, so I can't comment on it. <laughs> Sir. One of the problems with having served 24 years on active duty uh, is my hearing has gone somewhat. Is, could you could you come closer or have someone repeat the question, please? Talking about how you feel about utilities like back orifices. Okay, a fan I am not, obviously. Although uh, uh, I am uh, willing to trade the cult. I have a very nice uh, Army Information Insurance Cup, and I'll, I'll trade him for a CD and a T-shirt. Um, <laughs> There's no, uh, there's no big secret if you've uh, watched the media and so forth that uh, back offices causes some, uh, some degree of uh, stress and concern. Um, to con of course, to, you know you can uh, continue to do those kind of things. That's your first right amendment. Um, again, I mentioned yesterday that uh, case law is a bad thing to be the first one in. Uh, don't be surprised if sometime, someday, uh, people are held accountable for these kind of applications and the damage they caused. And that's about all I'll say at this point. Sir. Uh, would it be fair to say that uh, what happens with the money, uh, the real threat to the system, whether it's Homer, DOP, or whatever, really the user, and their lack of experience and expertise is educated? And then your, uh, anybody that's in the security field that handles concentrating too much on bringing up an actor to not educate the user problem? I think it's an age old. Um, the question, I'll try to rephrase it. Uh, the concern is whether we ought to educate our users more and worry less about hackers or you know, focus on the, the, the education of our system administrators. I am one of a growing school, I think, that says a user shouldn't be any more educated than using the system. And the system administrator, the service provider, ought to be uh, wholly responsible for securing and the integrity of that system. Uh, I think that we are focusing our attention and our resources on the system administrator, the service provider, the technology infusion to provide that security. The user should have password or access control mechanism, whether it be biographic or biometrics or this kind of thing, but I don't think educating the user on system access is the solution. There is some work to be done there, but I, I tend to uh, shift that burden to the service provider. Sir? It's, let me clarify. Uh, it's not that I didn't want to talk about it. I truly do not know about it. My job in the department is computer network defense, not computer network attack. Okay, and I focus on, on that. The ethical, the ethical issues on computer network attack, um, I'm not sure that I have in my own mind determined what the grounds rules are. We had a discussion last night uh, by the pool with uh, Dr. Honker and a few uh, others about um, the legalities of a stage of war and what constitutes an attack. In a traditional sense, in the physical world, you throw a bomb at me, uh, it's very clearly that you've attacked me. You shoot at me and I know this as well. You penetrate my system and violate my sovereignty uh, folks consider that to be an attack as well. But from a legal perspective, I don't know what constitutes an attack, and I don't know that Congress will wrestle with that anytime soon. Um, should we not counterattack in the same manner that, that we are attacked? Those are decisions that have to be made by people way above my, uh, my food chain. And again, I'm not answering your question, but I simply don't have an answer for you. Is the, the next speaker here? I don't want to get into your time. Okay. Your question, sir. Yeah, you just mentioned that, uh, that you feel that you should counterattack if you've been attacked. Do you feel that the government has been attacked by the Yugoslav government? Uh, the I don't know.
I'm not out of here. Okay, uh, I have uh, run out of my time. I appreciate, uh, again, the invite here. I appreciate uh, your attention, and uh, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much.